Hi, right, welcome to Elevate Speaker Series, Episode 9. I'm here with Rachel Robertson. Uh, Rachel, thanks for joining us. Hello. Hi, everybody. So I'm here to talk about Pilates for high-performance athletes. So a lot of people think about Pilates in the rehab sense, either um, for people with injuries, dancers, or females. So I want to kind of tell you the truth about Pilates um, and the benefits of it. So just to give you a little bit of a background on me, um, when I was in university, I had a roommate who was looking for a job and she came across an advertisement to become a Pilates instructor. And I actually applied because I was like, I need a distraction while I'm studying for my kinesiology degree. So I went and studied Pilates at the same time. Um, now a Pilates training is not a weekend course. It literally is very similar to yoga. They do like 200 hours. I actually don't know the total amount of hours, but I would go twice a week, um, and take classes while I was also doing school. It was actually a huge benefit because it actually took my kinesiology and allowed me to apply it. What were your preconceptions so, about Pilates, Rachel? But just before we move on to that, I'm, I'm really glad you said you want to dispel some myths. Because what were your first thoughts about Pilates before um, you were journey? For me, I kind of just thought it was a form of fitness. Like I had no expectations. And when I applied for it, they just said, come and take a couple classes first. And I loved it. Like mm. there was just something about the way you move that made me feel good. Um, and the, the key is the way you move because a lot of people will say, and there's, this is not a knock against yoga, but people will say, oh, Pilates is like yoga. Mm -hmm. And to me, the reason Pilates is not like yoga is we move. It might not be fast, it can be, um, but the movement is what really attracted me because I'm kind of someone who fidgets and whatnot. So, it was the movement that allowed me to really adapt to it. Um, that's one of the misconceptions. It's holding poses in yoga that people think of, and that doesn't happen in, in Pilates. And what? Unless what, you're holding a plank, we do plank, but yeah. Sorry. So, were you using it as a supplementary training, or just something to have fun? How were you use it? What kind of you? How were you using it as a tool? At that point, it was just interest based. So it wasn't until after university so i finished i started teaching in 2007 so i was in university um i started 2005 and i started teaching in 2007 and when i graduated in 2009 i um actually very fortunately had a physiotherapist who was like you are going to see all my clients so in the beginning i was using pilates as a rehab tool for people who were in car accidents specifically. She specifically worked with people who were recovering from car accidents. So I really learned how to work with low back pain, but low back pain doesn't apply to just people who are in car accidents, right? Again, athletes oh. experience low back pain, your average person. I think the statistics are about 85% of the population will have back pain at some point in their life. Yeah. So I was really learning to apply those concepts. Um, I have a history of also figure skating. So this could be also where it really appealed to me um, was again, the movement. And what is really important in figure skating is core strength. Um, and so Pilates really develops core strength a lot of people would say to me, oh, you have amazing posture because I stand very upright, but I actually was overextended due to plot or figure skating. So Pilates actually trained me where I should be. Um, and that also helped reduce my back pain that I was experiencing from the posture of uh, figure skating. When I was going through that phase of my life, I actually was still competing as an adult. 
So I had stopped figure skating when I finished high school, went off to university, but then I started figure skating and actually joined a precision team as an adult. Um, and so that was very beneficial, but I'd also just prior to that had been in a car accident. So I've, I've experienced all the reasons why Pilates is good. I had to recover from a car accident. I had to complement my training as an athlete. And then I was also using it for work and helping other people with injuries. Then we moved to Nanaimo, BC. My partner was already into kettlebell sport. And it was funny, I always kind of was like, no, I'm not getting into kettlebell sport. <laughs> and then I witnessed, he, he went and competed. And I witnessed four women sitting, standing on a platform, different ages, different body types, lifting 20 kilogram or 24 kilogram bells. And I was blown away. I was just like, look at these women. Look how strong they are. Look at, and like the one woman on the platform was so petite and she was just swinging that thing. And I was like, okay, that's it. I'm doing it. Really? And, um, but I understood one, I need strength training. Like in general, as I've gone through my courses, as I've gained more and more experience, how important strength training was, that's what kettlebells was going to provide me. Right. Um, but I also know what Pilates provides and that's the working, the small muscles. That's how I always look at it. Pilates works your little muscles and then your weight training or your sport or your lifting is your big muscles. So they complement each other and put all the puzzles, pieces of the puzzle together. So when I got into kettlebell sport, I knew that I needed to implement it. And that was um, really important to me, um, partially to keep my love of Pilates going, yeah. even though I was developing a new love for kettlebell sport. I just, I knew I had to kind of implement it into the training. And for people who don't know how to sit still, this is the best thing. Because if you're properly following a program there are rest days yeah. so olympic weightlifters they have days off kettlebell lifters they have days off power lifters they have days off um or even someone who's following like a basketball team when they're traveling they've got a day off but maybe they don't like to sit or they feel like they have to do something and they can't really take that rest day and they know that they should foam roll and they know that they should stretch, but they just can't do it. To me, this is where Pilates falls in. And that's what it was for me. Like when I was training for world in 2017, a day off was like a day falling behind. Yeah. And I wanted to be able to show up do exactly what I wanted and be able to walk away and say that I did everything I could. And that's why the results were there where I didn't want to be like, Oh, well I took two days off every single week. Well, if I didn't take those two days off, what if I just didn't want that? What if that's where the Pilates came in again, I could have Pilates to support that recovery. I wasn't taxing my body. And there's a few reasons why. I'm actually going to skip ahead. So um, there's aspects of Pilates, and this is why I knew that they would help with my recovery, but also keep me moving. Core stability is the activation of deep stabilizing muscles of the trunk and they support the lumbar spine and pelvis. So a lot of movement, a pitcher, for example, they just throw the ball. They don't think about how they throw the ball. But when you're a kinesiologist, you have to study movement 
and we start to study like where does it start from what position do they start from and then all the different planes and axes that they move through well what's in the center your core right and to have a strong center is only going to develop a strong arm to throw that ball so that's one sport um for kettlebells it was like same thing from my center where do i generate all my power from if i stabilize my trunk and then generate my power from my legs that's what gets the weight over my head mm -hmm. um so that's where the core stability comes in yeah it makes a lot of sorry yeah it makes a lot of sense um right you know what's the difference then if i can just interject people, yep. think of, people think of core people think of ab crunches people think of planks so what right. would be the difference in training through pilates to get core strength than, so yeah, the way you want to think again how i was saying like pilates is the little muscles and your sport or your activity is your big muscles you want to think of working from the inside out mm -hmm. and that's where the little muscles come in so when we're doing exercises more about holding your trunk still so we're not holding position we're holding our trunk still and then moving our limbs so in this picture that's here my pelvis is staying still and my ribs and my arm are moving like this is actually a a movement it's not a stretch i'm not staying in this position so my ribs and my arm are opening up but my hips and that's the key thing about this exercise if i did it incorrectly my hips would be twisted and my knees might lift off the floor but i don't want that i want to stabilize the pelvis and then move everything around it so that's where the core stability is important is learning to stabilize the trunk and move the limbs in in various positions so we've got all our different exercises in the pilates repertoire that allow you to challenge that does that answer your question definitely thank you perfect so then we've got muscle control isolated segmental control of spinal movement with or without the limbs so that kind of expands on what i was saying right yeah. so a lot of people know a glute bridge where they lie on their back their knees are bent and they lift and lower their hips yeah so that to in the pilates world is actually a neutral spine movement their spine stays still it stays the exact same when they go up and down but then we have what's called a pelvic curl and you are articulating through the spine. So they're actually rolling through their back to come up and then rolling through their back to come down. Mm -hmm. And to be able to have that motor control is actually really important. But to develop that, you have to be very aware of what's going on. So learning to um, move your joints as well as stabilize them. And to be able to have that control is super important. Because again, if we go to the pitcher and they unconsciously throw the ball and then they consciously throw the ball, they're probably gonna have more, um, they're gonna hit their target better. They're gonna have probably more speed and power than if they unconsciously throw it, right? Yeah. So with working these small muscles and these uh, kind of micro movements, if you like, do you think you see short term gains with that? Or is it more, are you playing the long game here, this kind of training? You're playing the long game. Definitely. Yeah. But for an athlete, isn't that your goal? Most certainly. Right? Like none of us want to end our career at 15. Mm -hmm. Like for me, I'm 34. If I can still step onto the platform at 50, even plus, I will be please is all can be because <laughs> i see people who mm -hmm. are stepping on the platform they ha have masters categories i want to get on the platform and have a gold as a master as well as a um i don't know open whatever the open category would be referred to amateur I guess, right <laughs> and is there a way to measure like how can you quantify um the training of these smaller muscles is there a way to measure or is it based on performance well I would say with Pilates, there's 
kind of this whole perfecting of movement, right? Like you're constantly learning to the same exercises over and over to get better at them. But for an athlete, that's not going to be their focus. Um, I think where the Pilates would fall into is, are they avoiding injury? That's huge. Right. If you can get through your whole season and not be injured because you did Pilates and versus a season where you didn't do Pilates and you did get injured. Um, if you can avoid that, I think that's huge. Um, different things like, are you recovering from your game better? So if you're playing a soccer game, but every time you get sore, but then you start doing Pilates and you're not getting sore or your recovery time is better. Um, when I was in university, I used to run, take a Pilates class and run home and I would compare my time and I would drop four minutes on my run home. No way. Yeah. Four minutes. Okay. That's actually quite a bit. Yeah. And it was 5k. Yeah. There you go. That's a percentage for sure. That, and what that comes to is my third point. So Pilates inc incorporates a lot of breathing. It's not like we're sitting there going, <laughs> but it's being conscious of your breathing. Yeah. And because of that, on my way home, I had better pacing because I was breathing better. I had better awareness of my breath. I could control my breathing better on my run home. So when you say control breathing, is it something, are you taking longer, deeper breaths? Or is it just, just simply you're conscious of it and you're, and you're just breathing in a relaxed way? So it would be dependent on the movement. Right. So certain movements, you're going to maybe deepen the breath. So you're going to elongate the breath because of the type of movement or you're timing your breathing with your movement, um, as well as certain movements require a certain breath. So as you're sitting up, so if I'm lying down and I roll up to sit up, an exhale is going to help me contract my abs and get me up right. or if i were to do that on an inhale my legs would probably lift up my form wouldn't look that great so the type of like inhale versus exhale is going to affect the movement or affect the difficulty of the movement so is pilates and yoga obviously they're very similar in that aspect yes is they're um, similar in so, the, the awareness of breathing for right. sure yeah. So have they, have they connect, have they evolved together? Have they kind of connected in, in the history of these two? Uh, I don't know what you would, you'd like to call them art forms or movement patterns. Um, like of the, of the both genres, have they connected ever? Um, well, you'll see crossover, but, um, the guy who developed Pilates, which I actually have a couple slides on that, so I can touch on that since we're just covering it. That's the guy, Joe Pilates, of course, Joe, Joe Pilates. Pilates. That's awesome. And he initially was, um, so Pilates has only existed since the 1920s. Yoga, my understanding is like super old, mm -hmm. um, where Joseph Pilates apparently had asthma, rickets, and rheumatoid fever. And Therefore, because he had these ailments, he wanted to get stronger. So he already has that mindset of like the type of movement that's going to make you a better person. Um, and so he became a gymnast, a diver, a skier, and then he worked as a circus performer, a boxer, and a self-defense instructor. Wow. What a guy. And yeah, so he has a history of sports and movement. He also worked with the military and helped um, a bunch of anyone, veterans who were injured, he helped them recover from the war. Um, and he, he did that before he came to America. And then he developed, um, opened up a studio in New York City and that's where a lot of people learned Pilates. So Pilates is very big in North America because that's where he was located. But he's originally from Germany. Mm. So but, I, wonder, I wonder if his ailments, I mean, you might be to tell me this, did his ailments decrease or were they curtailed because of this, because yeah. of his, uh, his finding of this? 
Yeah. So it was mainly when he was a child that he experienced those. Right. And then he got involved in all these things and then he didn't really have issues with it. And the breathing was partially because of the asthma, right? Like the breathing portion of the exercise was for him to control his asthma and not have outbreaks from it. Um, it's now he did not call it Pilates. He called it controlology because it was the control of the body by the mind. So again, thinking about your movement when you're going through it. Yes. So you're concentrating on the body during the movements to achieve quality movement and good form. And that kind of, it just builds the principles of Pilates. It, it shapes it where the, the man he was and his thought pattern. And I think it's really important that we acknowledge that it was a man that designed it. I'm not trying to like, who is it? yammering <laughs> but what i mean is a lot of people think pilates is for women or for dancers mm-hmm. and um so a lot of men don't get into pilates but he was a gymnast and it was about strength right and control of your body and um so i just want people to be aware of that because there is that misconception that it is for the frail or for women or dancers. And it is super, super beneficial to the strong. Um, now, a lot, did you have a question? No, sorry, go on, I'll, go on. Um, a lot of strong people can be super tight. Yes. Um, and I think that's where flexibility is really important. Um, you wanna be able to move your joints through full ranges of motion. But again, like I said, what I love about Pilates is that you're moving. So we don't hold, it's not like we fold over and touch our toes and hold it. Um, But we'll go through ranges of motion that will feel like you stretched afterwards. So in this picture, I'm on a reformer, but what, what is on there is actually a mat converter so that I can also use it as a mat as if I was on the floor. If I were to take that away, there are springs and you can kind of see them hanging on the back piece that we use for resistance. And one of the exercises you can do is you lay down on your back, you put straps onto your feet and you lower and lift your legs. Right. And as you're lowering and lifting your legs, you're getting a hamstring stretch, Mm -hmm. but I never have to stay there and hold the combination of positioning my pelvis, engaging my abdominals so that my pelvis stays still, right? That trunk stability that we were talking about before. The leg movement and then the resistance creates that stretch into the hamstrings. Right. And then there's different leg movements that you would do while you're in that position, whether you're lowering and lifting, whether you're bending them, doing circles, and they all stretch the hamstrings in different ways at the same time as strengthening. Yeah, so I can certainly see the connection and with kinesiology and how it's resonated with you and your study so much because they're so interwoven. Yes, yeah. And um, for me, it, I feel strong when I have really good posture. Yeah. Um, when I feel like I stand tall. I'm five foot two and most people think I'm five foot five, five foot six. And, um, I, I take that as I have good posture. I I'm aware of my body, but I also think it's because I'm strong. A lot of people, if you look at an older person, they start to kind of round forward Mm -hmm. and that's partially because they're losing that strength to keep themselves upright. Right. So I, I see it as a, a sign of strength and that's why kids who are young and active they stand tall they move around really well and i think it's important that we think about that as well so for those people out there thinking hmm never really thought about my posture do i have a bad posture or not so what are some of the telltale signs of a posture that needs improving um if you 
like look at anyone in your household they're probably sitting at a computer at some point how are they sitting at that computer yeah. probably rounded over <laughs> yeah. um that that is an easy way just to look at them um where if they're sitting upright and their back looks kind of straight mm. we have natural curvatures to our spine but for the most part your back is upright with that natural little curve in the spine yeah. but if they're slouched forward there's a huge curve in their upper back and their yeah. shoulders are rounded forward and some people walk around like that right mm. it can even be seen as a sign of like poor confidence hmm. for someone who's confident they look open they, they're tall, they're looking straight forward as they walk, right? And um, you can see the difference, I would say, as well as young kids who play sports, they have more confidence, they walk around a little more upright. Mm -hmm. So th those are signs that I would look for naturally without having an assessment. Yeah, right, interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so then I wanted to kind of, I picked out three, uh, various athletes that are known for doing Pilates just no to kind of That's cool. really share, um, that I'm not making this up and I'm not the only one. <laughs> um, you make it up, you pick three good athletes. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I am a basketball fan, so it was easy. I knew that there were basketball players out there, and I know a lot of people know who LeBron James is. Um, so what I found when I was doing my research was uh, he chooses it to increase his flexibility and stamina, and he actually believes that it has allowed him to play upwards of 40 minutes of game time without any issues. So they record game time. And obviously he's paying attention to how he's feeling throughout that game time. Right. Wow. So, and I, I would say his stamina is definitely improved from the breathing aspects of the Pilates. And there are pieces, there's so much equipment when it comes to Pilates, but we can add jump boards uh, to our reformers so we can incorporate cardio to the Pilates. Mm -hmm. uh, not just it, it is known as a low impact exercise but we can take it up a notch if we need to so, so says tom brady was a fan of the reformer is that a, a movement uh so the reformer is actually that piece of equipment that was in that last picture uh, um, oh yes here it's just that the mat is on there so it doesn't look like it's full form um actually i have another picture so here this oh, gentleman yes. is on a reformer um, I actually purposely found this picture because I've worked with this instructor and she works with a lot of NBA and uh, NFL players. And this guy is, um, I'm not sure. Well, she's in Philadelphia, so he must be off of the Philadelphia team in, in NFL. Mm -hmm. So Tom Brady um he likes the reformer probably because of the springs and the resistance right so the thing about springs is you have to resist it in both directions if you were to push against the spring and let it go you would know that it is just going to make tons of noise and it's going to crash so you constantly have to control the machine and then you're getting double the work um, and he likes it for his low back and his abs. So again, that trunk stability, right? Mm -hmm. He's obviously super powerful, super fast, but to be that fast, you've got to have good trunk stability and he's going to get that. And it says that he likes working on his lower body, abdominal muscles and obliques. So again, trunk stability. And then I'm going to butcher her name, Maria. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, again, she likes the core workout um and believes that's the center of the chain to everything so th exactly what i i had to put her quote down because that's exactly what i think yeah. our core is our center and no matter the sport that's where you begin your movement and that's where you go to right um so those were 
the three athletes that I picked out. So like the main things that you want to think about, why would an athlete want to perform Pilates? It is low impact. So if you're looking for a day where you want to move, you're not going to tax your joints. It's gentle on the joints. Um, you can get some stretch out of it. You're getting active recovery. So you don't have to sit around on a couch. You can do something without overtaxing your body. And that's the thing is recovery is super important. And I'm not saying do not recover. It's just some of us struggle with having that rest day more than others. Yeah. And this is a way that you can cope with that by having gentle movement or working on your weak points, right? Um, we all have a weakness. No one, no one is a superhero. And um, we need to be thinking about what should I be avoiding? So kettlebells is a lot of shoulders. I should be working on my rotator cuff because my big muscles, my delts, my lats, my traps, they're getting worked. What is not getting time? My rotator cuff. So I need to spend time working on the little stabilizers of my shoulders to, to complement all that heavy load that I'm lifting. Mm -hmm. and, and same with the trunk work. I'm, I'm getting lots of back extensors, hip flexors, but I do need to work those stabilizers of the trunk. The other thing, um, and not all sports fall into this category, but for kettlebells, it's all in the sagittal plane. So it's all moving forward and back. There is no side bending and there is no rotation. Therefore, I need to incorporate that at some point throughout my workouts to truly move well and to stay healthy. One of the first things that I see disappear out of my older population is decreased movement inside bending and rotation. And if they don't have a pre existing reason why they should be avoiding any of those movements, we should be maintaining it. So that's another important thing. Um, and then I touched on. I would, I would imagine athletes and swimmers um, who are can be quite linear, especially on the track. Yeah. I would imagine uh, something like Pilates might might benefit those guys too. Definitely, yes, yeah. definitely. Um, like I would say, they get rotation, but they probably don't get as much side bending. Right. But at the same time, um, they actually probably would benefit definitely from the stabilization because yeah. they get so much rotation with yeah. like, I'm, I'm just picturing front crawl in my head. Yeah. And then, yeah. So then you mentioned that I should talk about how I'm a new mom. <laughs> yeah. So let's, let's just rewind a bit. Thank you for talking about uh, really getting into the Pilates side of things. That's kind of what I wanted to shed some light on and dispel some myths. Cause I think it could be a really benefit to a lot of athletes, local athletes and coaches out there to put this into their training. So let's rewind. Um, yep. Let's talk about your kettlebell, uh, your kettlebell career, if you like, and, and your okay. passion for it. And, and I know we've discussed this before. Uh, I came along to the, the kettlebell club, and you guys put me through a workout. Um, yeah. So, but what is kettlebell training, and, and, and as a sport, can you can you kind of shed a light on that? Yeah. So kettlebell sport, um, a lot of people know Olympic weightlifting. So you have your snatch, and then your clean and jerk. Yeah. So we have the same with kettlebells. Um, did I put a kettlebell picture in? I think I only put, yeah, I didn't actually have a, a vent picture. Um, is that you winning? Yeah, that was from Worlds. That's, that's all you need right there. There it is. <laughs> so uh, we lift the weight repetitively. Instead of one rep, we lift it repetitively for 10 minutes. There are either five minute, 10 minute, now they do 30 and 60 minutes. Um, but we, I specifically compete in 10 minute. Um, and you can do single bell or double bell. So um, the sport is endurance, muscular endurance, but requires strength. Um, at the time in 2017, I was lifting the 24 kg for one arm long cycle which is about roughly 56 pounds i believe yeah 
and I did 101 reps. So that's quite a bit of volume. And then for snatch, I did 16 kg, which is about 36 pounds. And I did at that time, I think 111 reps. So the volume is definitely, think um, to me when I think of this sport again, why I would have to do recovery for this is it's a repetitive sport. So you're using the same joints over and over again. Yeah. And so we need to make sure that we're keeping them strong and healthy. Do you um, think there needs to be a certain mindset for sports like that? I often think that we're rowing. Like if I get on the roar in the gym, man, I, I, I look at my watch. I think there's half an hour gone. There's like three minutes gone. Yeah, definitely. Uh, do you think that kind of you need that mindset to keep going and, and kind of will yourself to the end? Well, and it's it's funny because there's always the conversation amongst lifters of the athletes who grind and they have horrible technique. And then people yeah. who don't just don't have the grind, but they have good technique. Right. Who's gonna win? Well, the person who can grind, they're gonna win. Because they're gonna be like, you ain't you going down, I'm gonna beat you. That's exactly what they're thinking, right? Um, so there's definitely a mindset that comes with it. Um, and I've done, like, for the sport specifically, mindset training. Thinking, like, Jeff, you've had Jeff talk. Um, I've gone to some of Jeff's workshops, applying that stuff um, just to make me focused on the platform is mm. definitely part of it. Where Figure skating um, for me was definitely mental, um, but there's so much more technical to me. And that's my opinion when I compare the, the two sports. Figure skating is so technical and yeah. it, it's challenging. Like people wouldn't know that if your skate pick just lands off a little bit. And the judge thinks that you landed that way. That's a cheat. And that job was no good. And I remember learning that at an early age. And I was like, I landed that. I, I, uh, and no, the judge just didn't think my foot landed right. And that was a cheat. So, so yeah, anybody who, if anybody who hasn't watched, just go to YouTube. And you can actually see Rachel in action as well. Uh, listening. I mean, it does look like a grind. And it does look like repetitive. Um, and that rhythm, man, that rhythm must, just must be, um, you must, must have to try and perfect that. But what I want to talk about is having a kettlebell in the corner of your house. It must, there must be so much you can do with the right training and the right technique. Yes. Um, especially, yeah, during, especially during the pandemic right now. Uh, well, it's, it's, maybe, maybe it's, it's a, it, it takes up very small space. Yeah. It literally will take up the corner of your house. You probably need, I don't know, I don't know measurements, maybe a three by three mat. And that's all you need space wise. Right. And you could do tons of stuff. You don't even have to do kettlebell sport. You could do deadlifts. You could do goblet squats. You could do rows. You could do basic functional training with a kettlebell. And then you could also do kettlebell sport. Um, mm -hmm. So, it, for people who are stuck at home and they can't do anything, but they think, well, I got this kettlebell. There's so much that they could do. And what do you, what do you think about the teaching of the technique? Because I got to tell you when I, if I do a hit class or like a circuit class and I look at the kettlebells coming up next, I'm like, Oh man, I'm going to, my back is getting through out here. Well, and there's different styles. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Right. Um, Cause there are times I go to a basic gym and I think, Oh God, look at that swing. But at the same time, um, the kinesiologist in me is coming out and I'm like, you're poor back. Yeah. Um, but there's different techniques, right? Like a CrossFit kettlebell swing, they go up and then they kind of pull it down. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, a hard style swing. Everything is super rigid as they go up and down. And then a kettlebell sports swing has a little bit of a bounce and a flow to it. So yeah. there are different things. The big important thing about any of the swinging movements, whether it be a clean, a snatch, or just your basic swing, 
what is the basic movement of that hip hinge? So a good morning or a deadlift. No one should be swinging a kettlebell unless they can properly hinge from their hip. That's a great message. So if someone goes to hinge and they squat, which does happen, yeah, they need to work on their hinge first before they even think of swinging a kettlebell. Right. <laughs> well, and you are, you, oh, you were, please, please excuse my ignorance, but you were the top, you were the top female, right, in Canada, at your, at your class? Well, that was in 2017. Yeah. I did not return to Worlds after that. So um, whether anyone has broken my numbers at Worlds, I don't, I don't know. I haven't really paid attention. Um, I'm now competing in different categories. Um, I'm now, just to keep pushing myself, mm -hmm. I now lift uh, double bells. And I'm doing two 16 kilogram bells for, and I've been specifically training for triathlon. So I have to do a 10 minute set of jerks, a 10 minute set of snatch and a 10 minute set of long cycle yeah. with all with the 16 kg bell. Snatch is just one bell though. Um, and I'm not a top athlete anymore, but that's okay. It gives me something to strive for. Um, while I was training for one arm long cycle, some of these women were training triathlon and doubles. So now that I've changed my direction in the sport, yeah, I'm not the top, but that's okay. <laughs> no, you know, I, th I think it's really inspiring because I, I spoke to Mandy Ray Kroc, uh, who was on the, on one of these episodes, a couple of times, uh, one of the first episodes we did, she's a, a seven time world champion free diver. Right. Got, in, got into the sport pretty late through some friends, um, but had a passion for the ocean. Um, and with the right training, the right dedication, she's world champion. And with yeah. your message as well, I mean, I mean uh, you know, athlete of the year in Nanaimo, um, Team Canada uh, champion. And, and you say you're inspired just by different, different uh, body shapes, different sets of people up there doing it. Yeah, exactly. And even... The, the beauty of kettlebell sport in the long run, what comes down to it is your own personal goals. So someone actually said to me, were you happy with your result at Worlds? If, if they had asked me about my snatch, I would have said yes. But they asked me about my one arm long cycle, which was with the 24 kilogram bell. And I said, no. And they were like, what? <laughs> in my head, I wanted 108 reps and I got 101. Right. And, but we also have to think about a few factors. I've only competed on the world stage one other time, which was in 2015. And I only did snatch at that time. I had to travel to a brand new country, South Korea, I'd never been there. Mm -hmm. Um, we had some hiccups along the way. We actually, our flight had gotten canceled and we were 24 hours late arriving to Seoul than we had planned. And we had planned to arrive so that we could acclimate. Um, so I had to like get that mindset. Okay, don't let these factors affect you. Be focused. And then I found out that if I got 108 reps, I would get international class master of sport. So that's what I wanted. I wanted this title. I wanted international. So I wanted 108. But oh, that's, that's a, it's great. It's such a great journey. And, and, and then you've embarked on another journey, um, which I, I believe is your next slide. And how's that going? It honestly is amazing. Yeah. It, I, I was not prepared for literally falling head over heels in love with someone. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the easiest thing I can say. Um, it's amazing watching Solomon, her dad, uh, yeah. and the two of them together. Yeah. It's amazing watching her develop and being a kinesiologist, I'm totally a movement nerd and watching all the motor development is like, Oh my gosh, look at this. Ah, she's rolling. <laughs> yeah, being, being, a, being a new dad myself, I can't believe 
I just expect them to fall on their face every every two minutes. But they right. don't. I guess the way they're structured and built, the hands come up, the hands come up, or the butt goes down first. They're just yeah. It, it is amazing. I mean, yeah, from an educated point of view, like yourselves, it must be just a case study every day. Oh, totally. Yeah. And um, if anyone's heard of the functional movement screen, mm. they kind of talk about basic movement patterns from a baby growing up and how important it is leading into our athletic careers. So I'm like, please crawl first, please crawl first. <laughs> um, that's what they say crawl before walk. Um, and he, Gray Cook, who designed it, designed the FMS actually says like, knock your child down if they start walking before they crawl. And I'm like, Oh, I don't want to be that parent. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's so intriguing. It's, it's super rewarding. Um, it's just been, I don't know. It takes my words away. It's been amazing. It's fun. It's a huge learning curve. That's like, you can't be prepared, but you have to be laid back, right? You got to accept every bump in the road and that's just the way it goes. And how's, how's life right now with the business and, um, and everything and, and the gym, obviously you and your husband, um, I have a, have some great outlets within the community. How's it, how's everything going? Good. We've actually had some major, um, changes, uh, not only because our daughter Charlotte was born, um, but Solomon has moved the Nanaimo kettlebell club to anytime fitness. Actually, right. he's now working out of there. He was, uh, running his, personal training business out of our home and we decided that it would be better um, for him to move to any time. So that gives him more, he's more out in the community and people can find the Nanaimo Kettlebell Club better. Um, we had to, with COVID, shut the business down. Um, and then what we did at first was, our immediate thing was anyone who wants equipment, come, come get it, rent it out, whatever. And so we gave equipment to our clients and then we went online. Um, Sully did it first, uh, partially because as kinesiologists there, we weren't covered insurance wise. Yeah. Um, so we had to kind of figure that all out. And that kind of um, mainly was towards like ICBC work that I do. Um, a lot of like practitioners, like, physiotherapists, doctors, they can use telehealth. Well, kinesiology was not as part of that. So we were on hold for a little bit. So we did online classes. We did two weeks of free classes of strength training and Pilates, and we would modify it based on the fact that people didn't have equipment. So we would um, incorporate a lot of body weight, and then slowly people were getting equipment, so we would incorporate if you have two different kinds of weights, you're going to do this weight first and then this weight second. Um, we kind of modified it that way, or we would get, give options. If you have a piece of a cardio equipment at home, pop on your bike for a minute. If you don't, then you're doing body weight squats, things like that. We would modify our workouts. Um, on this slide, uh, one is a snapshot of our online class. And then the other one is a client of mine who is following a home workout. So we've had lots of support. And I say support because everyone's under the, the same boat and finance has gone down. People lost their jobs or weren't working for periods of time. And the fact that people kept working out was really what was important to me because it's important for our physical and mental health. Um, but I also feel like people supported us as a, a small home business and, and a brand new family. So it was super, super nice to kind of have that community and people reaching out. Um, for my age, I didn't realize how technologically inept I was. <laughs> um, there was a huge learning curve. I got, so I use YouTube. I can create a live link and I can make it private. So only my clients get it and they get the link to it. Right. I was kicked off YouTube twice for um, breaking community guidelines. But when you're queuing Pilates, 
and you're saying hip bones and pubic bone and pelvis, the robots think other things. <laughs> yeah, it's sinister. Yeah. So I had to kind of learn to revamp my cueing a little bit as well, considering because when I got notified, YouTube says it's a robot. So you have to argue it and then they put your video back up. But it was unfortunate because you you're live and you get shut down. Right. Well, it's all learning, right? This is this is exactly. it. Strange yeah. times. Yeah. So what's the what's the goals for yourself? You you as an athlete, you as a business owner, what's the goals uh, for the next year? Oh, I am a goal setter. So um, athlete wise, my goal is to continue training for the tri the triathlon. Um, specifically, I want my long cycle to get back up to a hundred reps. Um, I was there before I got pregnant. So I kind of want to regain my pre-pregnancy fitness, um, specifically endurance, because when I was pregnant, I, that was the first thing I, I think month two, I all of a sudden felt like winded just walking. It was really surprising to me. And it's been the hardest thing getting my endurance back up afterwards. I feel like my strength is there. Right. Um, and I would love to kind of move up to the next bell by 2021. Um, but we'll see because sometimes I think we far ahead. Business wise, we're keeping the online stuff. We're looking at different options of continuously improving it. So we've gotten a new camera. We're looking at new ways of live streaming or different platforms um, because we want to prepare just in case there's a second wave. Yeah. Um, we're on the hopes that it won't or that we will have the safety measures in place that we can continue to train while physically distancing and things being appropriate. Um, so we're preparing for both options. Um, yeah. And then just continuing to grow the business. Like I am working part time because, well, I've got a newborn and she's only six months old. So she is priority number one. And my old baby, my business is priority number two. Um, but I luckily have great staff members who are super helpful um, and they, they're looking to expand their hours as they teach classes and personal train and whatnot. So yeah, just keep plugging away and keep improving and just helping people move better. Yeah. On that, as a, as a caveat to that, I also think that whatever sport, you're going back to and this is kind of a message to athletes and coaches out there i think you want to go back to a better landscape if you can and make things better a better a better athlete a better teammate so using people like yourself uh, uh your husband Sully, i think using these community people who have got these businesses who are trying to do a good thing i think it's uh it's very important for us moving forward so i'm hoping that there's going to be people out there who are looking for this um are they going to reach you on them handles? Is that, is that the best way to do it? Oh yeah. I guess I didn't put my email there. They can also uh, reach me out, reach me at info at return to form dot CA. Cause a lot of people try to email the dot com, but it's dot CA. <laughs> and kids don't email these days anyway. It's all, no. all Instagram and, and what have you. I've had, that's one thing I've had to dip my toe into Instagram and whew, it's, it's wild out there. I actually like Instagram. Uh, it's, it's my platform of choice. So, but people who follow me do have to put up with a lot of Charlotte photos, <laughs> but I think that's why most people follow me. They don't follow me for me. They follow me for her. <laughs> yeah. well, that's it. That's it. Yeah. All the photos, you know, it's fun times. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for your time on a Friday night with the weather being so nice. Hope you get yeah. to enjoy the weekend and, uh, just good luck in everything you do and uh, keep inspiring everybody. Thank you. And if anyone has any questions, they can always reach out to me. That's for sure. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, good night. And uh, we'll see you next time. Perfect. Thank you.